Good morning. My name is Kai Vecchio. Joining me is Andrew Sawyer and Robert Esperon. Our project is the FSAE Quick Shift System. In today's presentation, we're going to go over a little introduction of what is Formula SAE. Then we're going to move right into our designs, where our design fits into the vehicle system. We're going to move on to our paddle design, our pneumatic system design, our microcontroller and circuit design. And then we're going to go on to our testing, the results from that. And then we're going to move on to the cost analysis, how much it ended up costing us. And we're going to show you some pictures and videos, a little demonstration. And then uh, we're going to go right to engineering standards and design considerations. So what is Formula SAE? SAE has uh, two events. There's static events and dynamic events. Um, our project mostly focuses on the dynamic events because, uh, as you see, there's an autocross event, which is uh, what a quick shift system would actually impact the most. Um, our project, uh, this is a formula SAE um, kind of background, um, what they try to touch on each thing. And uh, our project focuses on the ergonomics with a little bit on the drivetrain because we actually have to be able to shift up and down. So this is a rundown of our system. It actually starts with the driver. Um, as you can see here, the driver would be holding the steering wheel. Activate the switch, there's a little switch right in here, which uh, goes to the Arduino. After the Arduino, it goes to the solenoid. The solenoid actually has the, connects to the uh, air compressor tank, and then uh, activates the actuator. So when designing a system like this, you have to consider the, the spacing that we're working with, because there's also, uh, like in a car, there's a dashboard and anything that can impact rotating the steering wheel. Um, and as you see here, uh, we have a nice flexible design for the paddles, and uh, you got to consider the functionality that they're actually going to be doing because uh, there's many different ways to actually have uh, a quick shift system just like in the cars nowadays. They have many different components and you have to see how each one is going to work and also <coughs> in the larger scale how it's going to work with the actual car itself. So next we have the design features um, and I'll pass this around so you can see. The, there's a curvature feature so that when you click it actually feels uh, right in your hands and it's not some stiff looking uh, board feature or anything like that. Then you have smaller components with the, with the switch mount and there's actually uh, later there's a little, a little casing so that the switch won't move so it makes it easier to have, actually have something stable. Um, and there's wire ports for convenience so all throughout this little switch mount and to the bracket there's little wire mounts so that when you pull out the wires and have it connected to where the shaft would be and make it easier for uh, to connect to the actual system. And this is a picture of the paddle assembly which you guys can see later. Um, and basically we had to keep in mind the amount of space that we we're working with which is right around 2.15 inches roughly between the dashboard and this hub. And we actually made this uh, for it to fit between this purple hub and the steering wheel. And then one of our future works is to actually place it here like it's here. But with that 2.15 inches, uh, this kind of protrudes a little bit. So uh, the redesign for it would be to flip this around and uh, be able to have it uh, at a slightly, uh, um, not so far, slightly uh, better angle for it. I'm going to jump right into designing a pneumatic system. So we know that we need 20 pounds force to ship. So after narrowing down the choice of cylinders, we're going to choose between a 3 fourths and 9 sixteenths. Quick view of the table will tell us that a 3 fourths cylinder gives us more room for flexibility and error later on in our design. We have a 2 inch stroke. It's going to be, uh, the cylinder is going to be one, in, 1 inch on each side because we need 1 inch on the stroke to go up or down. So it will be centered with 1 inch on each side. We have a 3 way 2 position solenoid. It will be normally closed. And the pneumatic source, we decided to go with a high pressure air paintball tank from Ninja. It's 50 cubic inches and it has a maximum pressure rating of 4,500 PSI. This is important because there's going to be two variables that will determine the amount of shifts that we, we can have. So these, these variables are going to be the uh, operating pressure of the system and the pressure that the tank is going to be filled to. So the determined operating pressure, if we fill the tank to a 3,000 PSI, we'll get approximately 700 shifts. If we fill it to the max of 4,500 PSI, we'll get approximately 1,100 chips. But one of the things that we had wanted to do was 
actuate the clutch as well via an air cylinder. However, the air cylinder proved to be too heavy because the cylinder would have been really large and the associated components just really would have thrown the weight off our design. We have to seek an alternative, alternative to actuate the clutch. Moving on, we were looking into the uh, different microcontrollers available. After looking at several of the uh, available microcontrollers, we decided to use Arduino. It has a, a large online support. It's very simple to code. And it operates at uh, 5 volts with a recommended input voltage of 7 to, 12, 7 to 12 volts, which is perfect for the vehicle because the vehicle is going to supply us with 12 volts. One of the other things that we wanted to look at is the uh, output current that the Arduino can provide. Unfortunately, it can only provide 40 milliamps, and we know that the solenoid is usually operating in a couple hundred milliamps. Our specific solenoid operates at 400 milliamps. So what we did is we incorporated an MPN transistor to bring down the current from the battery. An additional anticipated and encountered problems while testing uh, with the associated circuit are vibrations causing false signals, so we don't want the driver to go over a bump and, and shift when they don't want to. So what we did is we put a pull-down resistor between the, the switch and the Arduino. So once we got all that figured out, we wanted to know how our system will impact the uh, overall performance of the vehicle. What we wanted to do is determine the old shift time using the uh, hand-operated lever. So we used a normally open switch and we placed it in a, in a position that the driver would normally have their hands. So when the switch was open, it would give an output every 200 milliseconds. And when it was closed, when the driver would return their hand back to the steering wheel position, it would, uh, it, would, it would just reset and give us the final output. So with that, we found that the average shifting time was approximately 1.2 seconds. And if we include the, the loss of velocity while the driver was uh, while driving, that's 1.2 seconds that the driver would have their hands off the steering wheel and 1.2 seconds in the time. And if you know any time event, you always want the least amount of time because every second counts. So to test the pneumatic shifter, what we did is we set it up here. As you can see in the picture, we set it up on the old engine. It's the same model engine that's used in the current vehicle. And we begin by using the operating pressure that we determined from our previous table. And we, we found that it didn't work. So we increased the pressure by 15 every, uh, every set, and we were essentially doing the best out of 10. And we found that we kept failing, kept failing, and we, we got up to 120 PSI, and then we found that we would have 100% successful shifts. The Arduino had three inputs and two outputs uh, for each respective solenoid. The extra input was the neutral switch, so to get into neutral, what we would do is downshift the first, and then adjust the solenoid activation time to uh, approximately 15 milliseconds, and that'll get us into neutral. The solenoid time for the uh, regular up or down shifts is 150 milliseconds. So we went from about a 1.2 second shift time to 150 millisecond shift time. One of the things that I'd like to note is that the engine and cylinder must be absolutely fixed. A slight displacement of either can throw off the force dis distribution and then give us an unsuccessful shift. This is the cost breakdown. The most expensive uh, system in our overall design is the pneumatic. The pneumatic portion gives uh, approximately $550 total cost. Here are some pictures. They're a bit hard to see, but just to give you an idea of the limited space that we're working with. So the left one is top view, the top right is a rotated side view, and the bottom right is a sort of an isometric view. So let's see if it works. What I did is that you'll see that I moved the um, I moved the sprocket and then it'll it'll engage and it'll be it'll be stuck. So after every shift, you'll see that I'm able to rotate it again. So it lets me know that I successfully got to the next gear. And in that video, I did an upshift and a downshift. Okay. So now I want to talk about the engineering standards we incorporated in our design. Um, because this is a competition piece competing in a FSA E competition in Michigan. We had to follow the rules, so part of that, a lot of that is safety and ensuring that any uh, compose, uh, ex excuse me, any components exposed to high temperature environments are um, accounted for. 
The next standard I want to talk about is the parameter hardness for rubber property. This is because we have hoses um, going to our compressed air that we have to consider, make sure they're uh, adequate. The next one is for the additive manufacturing technology of powder bed fusion. This is because we had a 3D printing component. The following one is 303 stainless steel, the ISO standard. This is because our tank is exposed to corrosive environments from the oil to make it use uh, mortar fuel. Following that, we have the rated fasteners. Um, this is to ensure that none of our fasteners fail. And finally, we have the unified instrument threads to ensure that we have proper mating of our screws and our threads are, are tapped correctly. Some design aspects we had to talk about, or had to consider, I should say, is because FI, FIU uh, has global awareness and we are a majority Hispanic school, we thought it would be considerate to the team members to have a Spanish user manual for those students who prefer to read in Spanish. Other design aspects we had to consider were uh, the units, metric versus standard. Because FSAE is a competition in Michigan, in the United States, we decided to go with uh, unit, uh, standard units in our, for our selection of bolts and other things. Following that, we have to the driving styles. If we were to commercialize this and eventually uh, maybe license it to a, a car manufacturer, we wanted to make sure that it was uh, adequate uh, to be on either side of the driving. So in some areas we have the left driving, like in America, and some European countries we have right side driving, and we just wanted to make sure that it was adequate for that. Um, another great aspect of this project is the engagement we got from the FSAE competition. We were able to uh, interact with students from the global community because this is a global competition. This means that um, we can share their experiences through the FSAE official forums. Uh, shit, they, like, these are forms that people post their experiences, what worked for them, what didn't, and we can share our experience, and it was a, just a big collaborative effort, even though it is a competition. Finally, um, lifelong learning is important, and because we had interactions with members of the industry, we gained relationships and built these relationships so that we'll be able to move this and apply this to our careers. Future work? So for future work, uh, like I was mentioning before, um, we would redesign the bracket to actually uh, fit like it is now on top of that hub, which would mean uh, with that spacing we have, we we'll need to kind of mirror it so that the bracket does not face outward, it faces inward. And uh, with the amount of uh, spacing between the, the mount and the bracket, it will give enough uh, clearance so that you can uh, clip the paddles. And also, um, our manufacturing professor actually mentioned a more flexible PLA filament, so that would be something to actually look into as well. In addition, as I mentioned earlier, that we don't want any displacement for any of the, uh, the, the air cylinder when we shift. So this is the, the mount that we created and the rod extension. So what we'd like to do is add an extra reinforcement here to prevent it from flexing just a little bit. And that about sums up. Our presentation, we'd like to give a thanks to FI, FIU FSA for helping us out with the manufacturing, Dr. Tremonte. And yeah, do we have any questions? Sure. On the ergonomics, um, uh, I see that you kind of touched a little bit, but I wanted to look a little bit deeper on it. This shifter is it attached to the, to the actual steamer wheel itself. Right, it's not attached to the actual <coughs> steering hub. Well, it's meaning well, that at the three and nine position, the shifter is always on the driver's hands, right? So yeah, the yes. Okay. okay. What is the consideration of you know you're turning? Look at the motion that you're doing with your arms. Uh, driver stress and the versus instead of using paddles, where he's actually decreasing his grip on the gear, on the actual wheel, versus doing buttons, like Honda, F1 Williams, all these guys use work today. Have you considered that? Yes, and the thing is, with this competition, the steering wheel is, I mean, we actually thought of doing that, and the way the steering wheel set up, it would, I mean, it's possible, but in a way, it's, it's kind of going, because the way that it's set up, it's, it, we would have to make some type of bracket to connect to the actual wheel, and then where the wires would set up, and it was it was it's a you know give and take type of thing. 
I say that because of, of course, the driver fatigue. You're driving, I mean, this competition is short, but think about a Formula One race, right? You're hours at a time driving back and forth, pushing and pulling, trying to hold the steering wheel. At the same time, your G-force is pulling away at any given point. And your steering wheel is actually off from your hands, basically. You're just contacting yeah, the, the steering wheel on the front face of it while you're doing this, right? Well, so you, you don't have a complete grip of that steering wheel, even though you have gloves in, in place, you have your, you know, your uh, textured uh, contour on the wheel itself that doesn't necessarily flip off, but it could actually lose control of it. So these are things you have to consider if you're that going. Is, that is a very good point, and that's why the way this is kind of how flexible it is, you can actually flick it with just two fingers so you can actually maintain your dominant hand, your dominant fingers on the wheel and actually click it easily. So, I mean, it, we had to take into consideration with that as well. Finalizing in that, uh, one of the standards that you should be looking at through OSHA and ANSI as well, uh, contact points for ergo. Uh, you're measuring the amount of force that you're needing to actually effectuate the actual shift. So you better, you should look into those and have them as part of your presentation, have them as part of your report as well. And look into them because ever so more you're touching this with your fingers or the contact points. It also creates an inherent fatigue at the actual digits of the, the person. So think about that. That's right. Thank you. Did you think about doing a failure mode effects analysis on this design? Uh, yes, it's in our reports. It is in your report. Yes. yes. I've also run it on the, the brackets that we made, and it came out fine. Okay. Um, just so I understand, one side is the uh, there's two there's basically two switches, correct? One is the downshift, and one is the upshift. Yes. Yep. Okay. Is it intuitive? Yes. Can you have a situation where um, the operator hits the wrong one. It's unlikely. How's that unlikely? I mean, it, like you said, think it's about a, a car and how quick you have to make these decisions. Mm -hmm. it, you know, because if I think about a switch that you push up and push down, you're always going to push the down for a downshift. You're always going to push an up for an up switch. I've got a left and a right. Am I going to remember while I'm doing a fast maneuver to always pull my left one versus my right one? Absolutely, great point. But it's similar to how you got to train yourself to drive a car, uh, drive a car in, uh, when you first learn how to drive a car, excuse me. So you wouldn't press on the gas when you're trying to brake. You wouldn't press on the brake when gas. Some would. It's a similar, uh, <laughs> it's sure there's some training. These are commercialized. There are sports cars that, that do have these. Um, my old video games that one. So it's, it's not, I mean, it's a, it's a great consideration, but I don't think that's a, Okay, and when you went from low pressure to up to 120 psi to me is pretty high pneumatic pressure. Did you compensate for that in the safety side of the system? Oh, yes, yeah, so that's one thing that I forgot to mention. So the future work includes that when we ordered these initial solenoids, <coughs> we went we opted for the solenoids to have a higher flow coefficient because we were right in the middle. And unfortunately, they have a maximum operating pressure of 120 psi. So one of the things we're looking at is buying the solenoid with the lower flow coefficient, which should still be enough, but has a operate has a max operating pressure of 140 psi. And then, as well, they'll be smaller and more lightweight. So overall, pretty much the best control decision. Okay. Thank you. Are there any, this is obviously a very new design for this vehicle, are there any reliability concerns in the change from one design to another? Is, is there anything that's more likely to fail um, or more severe failure if it does occur? No, it's, it's just, um, well mainly it's just making sure our stuff doesn't fail. However, one thing that I would like to mention is that when you downshift, you don't want to uh, you know, go over, over your red and then destroy the engine. So what we're going to do is run the signal through the team's ECU, and essentially it'll state that when the ECU gets a signal, it can determine whether what the RPMs are at, and if they're above a certain value, it'll block the signal to the uh, to the Arduino. And if, if they're good and it's acceptable, it'll send a signal for that downshift. Okay. 